taking a deep tech masterclass. Sachin is the head of scale software program for Asia Pacific region for the Intel Core and Visual Computing Group, Developer Relations. Division uh, that Sachin drives the developer evangelism in the areas of artificial intelligence, IoT, and game development. He's worked on key projects of local language enabling, mobile application development, IoT, and partner marketing. Sachin, over to you. Now I'm uh, standing between you guys and lunch, okay? So I've been told to kind of reduce the master class to whatever I can, so I'll probably try to squeeze in as far as possible, but in case you guys want to continue, let me know. We can continue uh, as, as planned. So one thing uh, after Devika said about my introduction, I also have another interesting thing which I'm just speaking from the last session. I also have the mastery authority on Mumbai traffic and Mumbai potholes. I think that's another thing which I kind of come with, okay? So uh, without further ado, uh, let me quick start. Uh, I think we have already covered a lot of ground in the morning session where uh, the, the Minter CTO talked about a lot of things on deep learning and the possibility of deep learning. So I think my job is done easier, so I'm not going to kind of really cover a gamut of that, but I think let's kind of uh, look into what we can do. Before doing that, let me take a minute to talk about our birthday. Therefore, yesterday we celebrated 50th birthday for Intel, and I'll just show you a quick snippet of that. These are all 2,000 plus drones using computer vision, flying in the skies in Folsom, Arizona, and then really creating fabulous cards. images. The reason I put this across was to really show the power of computer vision and all the elements of learning around deep learning, which are now getting mainstream. And you can see, you can really do many wonderful things with those technologies. I think that's the kind of key message here. Now, I thought I could do three options based on the learning process. I can do a basic masterclass, advanced, or entrepreneur masterclass. So what do you want to do? Three? OK. So in terms of time, let me select three and then Let's go with three. So essentially, I think uh, we have to kind of relate to this cartoon, right? I think we have been seeing so many use cases, so many areas where we are kind of getting the power of machine learning, deep learning thrown at us. It could be as simple as applying the makeup or figuring it out, shoe sizes or whatever we are watching on internet, coming back to us and haunt us, hey, you have been kind of doing this, now let's buy this, right? Those kind of things happening all over around us. Now. At the behind of these scenes, there are multiple technologies that are at work. I think that's the kind of message which we are going to kind of talk about. And see how some of these technologies will really are kind of driving the changes, the way we are uh, behaving or the way we are uh, transacting across the globe. Now, I'm sure you all all seen these kind of uh, uh, models, right? We travel, we use Uber or any other service. It's all based on some kind of algorithms which predict our behavior, as well as the kind of uh, the, the, the traffic density around us. Again, there are the kind of live use cases where all these models are at work. We may not realize that. We may not even kind of appreciate how these things are powered around us. But I think at the back of those things is a great amount of machine learning and deep learning and overall AI is really playing the world. Now, it could be in the area of transportation like our maps or our uh, services like Uber and Ola. It could be in the area of uh, audience, how we relate to a certain uh, type of uh, music, a certain type of shopping experience. It could be in the area of how do we really uh, get content based on our mood, our uh, affiliation to certain uh, specific areas where we like to do, uh, do a few things. All of this is being now used by the service providers to really tailor that content to you, to your liking, to your behavior, so that you are able to understand and get what exactly is your need. Uh, we can also relate that to uh, shopping. It can be uh, uh, in the national language processing. It could be as simple as using our, uh, how many of you have uh, Amazon Echo here? Has anybody played with Echo? A few of the guys, I think most of the guys, right? I think these are the things which are now getting into our households. How do we really relate to a speech, which is a spoken speech in Indian accent, but still that little machine is able to figure it out what you want and able to give an answer to it. Again, those are things which are now coming our way. Object detection is another thing which we have been kind of uh, tracking. Uh, it could be cameras, it could be um, 
uh, our uh, CCTV cameras, and a lot of things have been kind of coming with those objectives also. Quick snapshot of what we had done a few months back as a, how the industry is shaping up this entire evolution of AI as a, as a whole. A lot of way to go, but there is a lot of intent by the enterprises out of India. Almost 70% uh, organizations are, are expected to deploy AI in the next 18 months' time. And this is a research we did along with uh, 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 IDC a uh, few months back. And I think the idea is here is that just to s understand, assess how much of that is coming to India as a deployment scenario. I think there's a pretty good opportunity that this is happening in India, not only those consumer-centric use cases, but also in large enterprises where deep learning or AI as a whole is making then. So I think that's the kind of good opportunity for all of us here to really go after and then see how we can make uh, leverage of that. All right, so now let's get into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of AI, right? So I thought I'll cover some of this. Now, in terms of time, I'm going to zip through it. In case you are interested to know more about it, uh, come and see me during lunchtime. We can have a much deeper discussion. So we'll go through some basics of uh, the definitions of uh, machine learning, deep learning, and AI overall. Uh, we'll probably skip the history part of it. I think this has been already been discussed in the morning session, so we'll skip the history part of it. We'll take a look at it. What is that is really happening today? Understand the AI from the modern uh, scheme of the world. And then also look at some of the deployment use cases and scenarios how AI is now making way. And what are the things we need to remember when we are looking at deploying an AI-based solution around us? I think that's the kind of idea which we had. Obviously, we had to run fast, so we'll kind of zip through a few slides. But in uh, the interest of time, I'll at least try to cover the key um, slides and key uh, information. All right, so let's go with the basic uh, concept, right? All of we have been talking about data is a new oil, and I will add to it AI is a new electricity. I think just like I'm adding in terms of what is the opportunity giving us to really talk about it. If you look at the way uh, the, some of those pioneers have been talking about, it's humongous in terms of the sheer opportunity which is giving to us, and I think that's where we are now looking at so many use cases, so many areas in business where these technologies are now making a significant change or significant transformation in the way this is going to come up. Sheer numbers, I think IDC expect this to be a potential 50 plus billion dollar industry right now. Obviously the future projections will be uh, in, in beyond order with that. I think that's the kind of numbers which we're talking about from this industry uh, taking care of all the use cases across various industries. Okay, let's come to the basics. Now, I'm sure some of you are already know this, uh, they are aware of that. How many Practitioners of MLDL, few of you. So in case I get stuck, I can ask you guys as an expert opinion, okay? So uh, pardon me if I can just ask you guys to kind of contribute to whatever I've been kind of talking about here. Now, let's look at the first one. We have been kind of talking about these all these things in kind of uh, parallel, right? AI, machine learning, deep learning. Are these things the same or there are differences in these things? I think they're not the same. There are a few subtle differences, the way we understand the literary definitions, at the same time understand the technology behind it. I think that's what we're going to do in the next couple of minutes time. Now let's look at what do you mean by the concept of artificial intelligence. I think these are the literary definitions. As long as you are able to imitate the cognitive aspects of human behavior, that's where the AI stands for. I think that's the kind of definition which we'll probably need to kind of take back home. There are various nuances, there are various uh, definitions of AI by various people, so don't worry about that. You can even call your own definition. But net net is, if you are able to create a simulation of more cognitive behavior using a computer science, that's what AI is. I think that's the kind of <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Base definition uh, AI talks about. There are various definitions by Wikipedia, various other um, tech companies that come with own definitions. I think it's fine. We can understand that, but I think that's the base concept. Let's look at machine learning. What is machine learning? Now, these are the, some of the basic computer science programs in which you try to solve a problem, right? Now, when you want to try to uh, solve a problem, just like any other uh, programmer, you will probably use a set rules and certain guidelines to program that a particular line of code and come with a solution. However, machine learning believes that 
The problem solution cannot be done by a set programming, but the system has to learn. And then based on that, it will kind of generate the, the final output. And then that's the kind of way you will, as you iterate that particular data more and more often, the machine will auto learn itself. I think that's where the machine learning evolved as a technology, almost like 30, 40 years back, it's kind of started as a concept. And I think we have heard in the morning session all this concept of expert systems and LISP and all of these were the backbone of the machine learning, what we really understand, which is there today. Let's look at it from uh, the different perspective. Now, these systems, they will learn repeatedly by seeing data again and again, over and over again. And not really they had to be kind of programmed by humans to run in a certain kind of uh, fashion only. They will learn from the data which is thrown at them. They will ingest the data, and then based on the data, how they will uh, process that, they will be try to kind of come with outcome, which is what we call it machine learning. Now, just a simple example: uh, when our email software solutions, we tag some of these like spam, right? I'm sure all of you are using some kind of uh, public email service, and again, some mails are kind of uh, mark as spam, right? Now, this has been done over a period of time, and the moment it starts catching up certain words or certain kind of data in that mail object or mail body, the engine kind of identifies as a small, uh, spam mail and then automatically categorize that. And more email it sees, it will be able to kind of further tone that uh, intelligence and really make that call to drop that email in your inbox or, or, or in the junk mail folder. This is one example of how machine learning kind of behaves by really using the data over and over again and then getting smarter at uh, making the decision. Uh, Simple example, it kind of picks up from a classification of data. There are certain measurements. And based on the measurements, how you can actually relate those measurements. And then attributes of those measurements, based on those attributes, it will then pick up uh, the closest matching last species column and identify, hey, can I then categorize the data into that kind of column? So based on those measurements, can I predict the outcome, which is the target column, which is mentioned there. I said that's the base, I would say, in a <coughs> very high level, how you can explain machine learning to a very uh, a simplistic term. <coughs> Sorry about that. There are a couple of types of machine learning. Uh, anybody wants to talk about it? Anybody wants to share what you see as two types of machine learning? The experts who raise your hands. Just uh, shout your answers. Supervised, unsupervised, yes, absolutely are right. Now, the difference between these two learnings are very straightforward. In supervised learning, there is a target column. There is something which is there to make a prediction and achieve that goal towards. And then obviously, there are various examples where you can use this kind of model to understand and then make use of that. In unsupervised learning, there is no target column. There is no predefined uh, kind of uh, set of rules which you need to kind of come with. It's about the attributes. It's about how you can come with certain features from the data and then use that attributes to really make that call in terms of really uh, what kind of structure you can identify in the data and then come with that structure. I think that's another way you can call the definition of the unsupervised learning. Now, there are various algorithms to make it work, so I'm not going to go to all these algorithms. I'm sure there are a lot of some computer science expertise uh, who can share more thoughts on that. But these are the base level kind of concepts of how these, th these terms are thrown at you. Simple example, fraud detection. Based on the transaction nature, based on the transaction, where it was done, how it was done, what kind of amount was captured, there are these kind of systems who will decide whether that transaction was a fraud or was a genuine transaction. Again, these are the systems which have been kind of now created with most of the banks who kind of sample and then make a decision whether the transaction is a good one or a fraudulent one. Now, machine learning has its own limitations because there are certain rules which is following. The classic example which all of us have been seeing is that identifying an image and define is a cat or a dog. Now, if you had to go with the traditional model of machine learning, you can define the image to be identified of two-leg or four-leg animal with eyes or ears. And then based on that, you have to decide whether it's an animal or a, a man or whatever. That's how the machine learning will, will kind of start behaving if you have to identify image between a cat and dog. But if you have to really make that work with the features of that animal and integrate that into machine learning algorithms, it will kind of really create very much a complex model to solve that particular problem. 
that's where we will have limitations of machine learning where after a certain point when you think when the problems become more complex when you are looking at solving a much more complex issues and uh, really more feature set uh, the, my, uh, the machine learning has uh, limitations on how quickly it can crush the data and provide a meaningful output to you. So this is how you will probably relate recognition of image, what that image is all about, and then obviously which features you will use and then take a call and then integrate that into the entire scheme of things. That's where deep learning comes in. So in the next couple of minutes, let me explain the deep learning and the concepts behind it. So if you had to do the face recognition in the traditional machine learning way, right? This is what we'll do. We'll probably pick up certain features, like, for example, the facial uh, size, or the type of the face, or distance between eyes, or the hair, the type of hair. All these could be the features of a face which we'll probably like to identify. And then if you pass an image of a person, let's say Arjun, based on those individual feature set, the machine learning has to take uh, provide the output and then decide who this person is or what's the kind of person's uh, uh, the face represent for. Now, as we increase the, the feature set and the complexity behind that, the entire process of machine learning becomes very complicated. And then you have to use a lot of compute, a lot of high power compute to solve that problem. I think that's where deep learning can approach the problem in a very in a different way. Now, imagine the same problem of passing the image of Arjun in n by n pixel format. So you pass that image through this set of rules. That's what we call it as neural network. Now, the neural network can be as layered as you want. And it will try to mimic the same way our human neurons will try to imitate. Because these are the kind of computer objects or mathematical objects which will kind of get uh, triggered when a certain threshold of that particular image or whatever that data passing through is really uh, kind of taken off. So these neural networks will then process the entire pixel set and then based on that learning of the pixel set, it will come with output and then we'll call it out whether this is human, cat, dog, and if the human, who that human is. I think that's the kind of way the deep neural network or the neural network will kind of evolve. And that's how we call it deep. Why we call it deep? The layers of that neural network, as you kind of added and more feature set, that becomes much, much deeper. And we are kind of seeing uh, uh, neural networks even of, uh, 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 almost like a thousand plus layers also available today and people are making use of that. I think that's where the depth of the deep neural network comes in. Now, two things which we can then take it from. Now, as we are creating these neural networks, there's something called learning or training the network, right? Because you can't do this one image. To ensure that you are making that network understand this is a human person called Arjun, you have to kind of send the data over and over again, right? So as more and more data you send to it, the, the system or the kind of the, the, uh, the, the model gets trained itself. Now, the way it works is that we can train the model to a certain degree. For example, let's look at the first example. We are trained the model to identify a picture, whether it's a human or a bicycle or a strawberry, right? And we pass the image to it. Now, the first pass, maybe the image which is going through is, let's say, a, 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 a strawberry image. The, model identifies the image incorrectly like a cycle. Obviously, there's an error. The error is passed back, deep learning. You are always worried about how accurate my model is to really make that particular decision and then take that information going ahead. The second part of these models, when they are actually used, is in the other side, as we call it the edge side, when you are making the inference of it. So you have a trained model. You are trained it to a certain degree of accuracy, let's say 89%, whatever that percentage is. Now, when you are making that use of that model in an actual situation, you have to use that model. Now, it's locked. It's kind of the weights which are used in that neural networks are completely frozen. And now you're using that model to infer the action on. For example, the same example of uh, computer vision. If I had to pass the Arjun's image in a passport control scenario, if the passport system identifies Arjun at that entry point, it's not training the model at that point of time. It's just using that model to infer who that person is. So there are two types of areas where we are looking at training, which normally happens at a data center or center place. Second part is an inference, which can happen at anywhere. It can happen at the edge. It can happen at the cloud. It can happen at the kind of uh, uh, the tools which we are normally seeing in our, in our environment. For example, computer vision. 
the drones which you saw, which are all like uh, floating around together, they had a computer vision uh, uh, system on them, and they were actually inferring the kind of the vision they are getting from the camera on the drone, and uh, based on the uh, the model which are already trained, they were making decisions and then taking actions on. So always in a, any deep learning deployment, training and inference are the two critical parts which are deployed on the ground. The entire advancement in compute and uh, the algorithms have ensured that the error rates or the types of errors used or kind of observed in many of these use cases are now brought down considerably. So with very much great accuracy now we can predict if you are running a use case either in um, a cancer detection or in fraud detection or any of these use cases, the, the errors which are now getting tracked are now getting reduced considerably. I think that's where the deployment of the systems are now happening in more, in more and more uh, situations. Okay, so we are kind of learned the basics, the kind of concepts which uh, are there. I'm sure some of you guys have uh, already gone through it, so um, a part of them about my uh, basic theory on that part, but I think we can just uh, get everybody on the same page to understand the, the, the base of uh, these concepts. There are many algorithms you can use for each of these two using that. I'm sure some of you have already uh, seen some of the algorithms, so I'm not going to go through each of these algorithms. These algorithms are designed for a specific activity, specific use cases. So based on what problem you want to solve, you can pick up this algorithm and make use of that. So again, I will leave it up to your statistician and the computer science minds to figure it out what is right for you. But these are the possible algorithms and there are new algorithms emerging uh, every day, which is the research is bringing together. All right, so I'm going to skip through this pretty quick. Uh, I think I'm running short of time. So we'll skip the history. We'll skip all those examples which got uh, shared in the morning session. You can quickly run through it uh, as I'm clicking the slides. These are the different uh, data sets now available to make use of uh, deep learning techniques. This is what we're doing. Uh, there are now various models in place. We are using that day in, day out. We saw some of these examples uh, in, the, in the morning session, the AlphaGo, and so on and so forth. So I'll skip through it. I think this is what is really good happening, right? Self-driving cars, we saw some examples. We always are using uh, communication. Has anybody used the real-time translation feature on your phones? You speak in English, and then something out comes out in Spanish, right? I think this is an interesting use case to really get that AI in our pockets whenever you go to a foreign country. So again, how to communicate with a data set or with some kind of your speech getting recognized and then output coming out of that. I think it's another way of using you know, the AI in a personal situation. Healthcare, uh, detecting cancer, detecting certain uh, uh, diseases based on the imagery. I think this is now becoming a very great use of AI. And again, there are always newer, new approaches of how people are making use of that, either in solving the problem or creating more accurate model so that the accuracy of these things are really um, uh, proven beyond a doubt. <clears throat> now, why this is happening now? Uh, I'm sure you have seen the machine learning been there for the last 30, 40, 50 years. It's really picking up today in today's context because of a few things. First is the compute available to you is now much, much cheaper and much, much stronger to solve these complex problems. Even if you have a multi-thousand layer uh, neural network, Today you have the capacity of compute to solve it and then identify that problem and come with a solution. I think that's the key part of really the, all the use cases now become very active in today's environment. Bigger data sets, faster compute, and then obviously there are involvement in the algorithm to solve those neural networks. I think these are three or four things which are really making the AI a practicality in today's scenario. I'm sure all of you have seen this humongous amount of data explosion all around us. All of us are party to it. We are generating data like, like anything before, whether this is personal uh, user creating data, whether this is uh, uh, automated vehicle or a plane or a hospital, each of the bodies are creating data. And that data needs to have some synthesis mechanism to come with some insight. I think that's where the basic premise of analytics started. And now with technologies like AI coming in, you can now create more possibilities of how you can solve the data analytics problem and then come with that. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to walk you through this, but there are various types of analytics. 
which are there in industry to solve the problem to get those insights from. There are operational analysis and the advanced analytics and as you go up the ladder, the technology which are deep learning and machine learning are able to create more insights and come with a lot of data which will give you that what can happen next or how I can predict the behavior of certain operational issues in whatever vertical I'm working on and then create a meaningful insight which I can act today and then solve that potential issue happening from now. So I'm sure some of you have been hearing about predictive maintenance, right? Or defect detection in, in manufacturing world. This is as old industry like mechanical engineering, but they are now using AI and machine learning to solve problems which are related to plant safety, uh, machines behaving uh, 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 erratically during certain uh, workloads, at the same time looking at safety of the, of the scenario. All of these industries are now looking at how they can use AI. And again, you can relate to some of the industry which you have probably seen examples from. It could be in our personal world, like personal assistance, our uh, consumer uh, behavior, retail, manufacturing, finance, healthcare. The list goes endless, including government. For example, as you are seeing all these complex network of CCTV cameras getting introduced in our roads, government is going to make use of deep learning to understand the traffic patterns, the parking and the vehicle and the, all those uh, challenges of uh, policing and monitoring, they are you're going to use computer vision technologies to find, identify what they can do with that data and then either police it better or take a control of the situation whenever there is a C, or they, they, they can see a situation evolving. So not any vertical I will probably uh, say is going to get left behind in the way they will use AI in the next few years time. I think that's where we see the world is going to and I'm sure you're also seeing the use cases in uh, areas around you where these are now really uh, making an uh, impact. All right, so last couple of slides, I'm not going to kind of dwell too much upon the actual nuts and bolts of what parts you can use. As I said earlier, this is normal way we will see things around us. There's a cloud, there's something at the edge, we call it the gateway system, and then there are multiple of things which are around us, whether it's car or phone or machine or whatever you have. All of that is kind of creating a system where you can deploy AI. Now, as we said earlier, training inference. Inference happens at the edge where the edge device is running. Then you have the gateway where you can also have inference or retraining to a certain degree. If you are capturing that video feed coming from a traffic camera, you may also require to do a certain amount of retraining at the edge level to ensure that you are not really going back all the way to the cloud using that heavy video data. So certain amount of retraining can also happen at the edge side. And at the cloud, you can do all. You can do train the model, you can do inference, and so on and so forth. So again, that's how where you can start visualizing how you can deploy the systems on the ground. Something happens at the edge, including our phones or little computer devices which you can deploy at the edge side. At the same time, all the way into the data center where you can deploy large compute clusters to solve a problem for training purpose. The the concept of video analytics is emerging and I'm going to just use that one use case to talk about how these things are happening. Uh, we saw some examples in the morning about video, your face getting captured and image getting captured, but apply this to more complex problems, right? In a city control center, when you are getting multiple fields of camera thrown at you, right? You need to make a real time decision on what car that is, or is it the car which is cutting the, the stop line, or can I identify the number plate of the car? All of these things will have to do be in a real-time situation coming from various streams of data thrown at you. So you have to have an inference system it has to be more powerful enough to not only identify, identify that particular inference engine but also act on that. I think that's where the complexity in the video technologies are now emerging and video analytics is the biggest AI opportunity all of us we are now seeing around us. It can be applied to various areas, transportation is one part of it. It could be in emergency response, services, autonomous vehicle, or even in smart retail. I think this is the biggest use case where analytics is now being used. And let me give a quick demo of the streams of data. This is a based on a tool which we provide called OpenWinner Toolkit. This is just to optimize the train model further when you deploy these train models on a piece of little hardware when you're deploying these this models for inference purpose. So we have a train model, 
but how you can make it more optimized, I think this is where this uh, toolkit really uses for. I'm going to give you a quick video. This is a toolkit uh, SDK running. Uh, we are passing through multiple video streams to the model, which are already there as a trained model. And then you can now check it out multiple streams coming from it. And you can identify the person, the person's characteristics, or the car, what object that is. And that is done at a super fast uh, uh, scheme of things. This model, in certain cases, is now able to run as big as almost 130 FPS per uh, FPS kind of uh, uh, threshold. So you can imagine the applicability of these kind of models or these kind of uh, technologies when you are actually looking at a real life scenario of complex video capture coming in a, a command control center of any police uh, organization in the world, and you are making sure that all the streams are then labeled, tracked, and then made intelligence of that, and then taking a um, specific call. So now there are these kind of inference engines available to make use of that, so that your trained model can also make inference in a pretty quick time. So I think that's where we are now kind of uh, seeing how uh, not only the compute at the data center evolves, but also inference at the edge really makes care of, uh, takes care of that. I'll probably skip it. We can uh, look into these uh, uh, ideas uh, as a round one conversation, how you can deploy these solutions. I think we can always uh, look into that philosophy at an uh, offline uh, discussion. Uh, there are ways to start planning about your AI deployment, get your data, get your data organized, create a model, build it, adjust the model for accuracy, train it, and then deploy it on the ground for a specific use case. This is a very, very uh, basic uh, deployment cycle for AI. What we are now looking at as we have started deploying these use cases with various customers, the actual piece of training your model is very small. It's just a black box in the center of it. The other areas around it, whether this is data creation, data labeling, data ingestion, at the same time, how do you act on that? There are also large subsystems of any AI solution. I think that's where we are now seeing how we are making work on that. So this is just one way of uh, sampling it. Uh, there are various ways we can share the data. I'm not going to go through this slide. It's a slightly complex slide. But in the interest of time, this is what we do. We have a lot of ideas around all of these things. Feel free to talk to us. Most of the stuff which we talk about is available on Intel's site. You can maybe come and talk to me offline. We have all the content to train you and teach you on AI is available on this site called software.intel.com. You can go through it and learn some of these complex uh, theory and complex um, aspects of the AI and deep learning. And feel free to talk to us. And with that, I stop here. I thought I did an OK job in giving you insights on AI as a master class. I would have loved to have some more time, but in this of I'm stopping here. I will not uh, hold you back from lunch. But uh, feel free to talk to me uh, during lunchtime. We'll be happy to um, give you uh, more insights on this. Thank you very much.